you lot are in for a treat today. I've rounded up three guests for you, and uh, they're all Lions tourists. Um, unfortunately, they missed out on this year's this year's trip, so we're all gutted about that. Um, but I would like to welcome Dan Cole, James Haskell, and we're hoping Rory Best will turn up at some point and sabotage it all. Um, so yeah, Dan and James, welcome. Hello. Thanks for having us. I knew you were going to pause really long. I knew it. I could see it in your fucking face. You're so awkward. Tom, um, please welcome these two very, very special guests to our show. Do it as best you can, please. Dan Hask, it's nice to have you here. We've got a lot to get through. Um, and I'm going to give you the opening question. Because this is what a lot of people wonder about the Lions when you first turn up, whether the hotel may be, if it's Penny Hill or if it's the Lensbury, wherever it may be. How do you bond, first of all? James, I imagine you just pile on in there. Dan, I imagine you sort of wait for people to make the first move. (laughs) (laughs) I was just trying to think about Coley. Coley, Well, I was waiting for you to go because you were going to... Yeah, I mean, look, I... I can't deal with awkwardness, and um, so I just go up and introduce myself and say hello. And I, I obviously, being the Marmite character that I am, I see people body language like tense up when I come round, and they're like, "Oh God, this guy!" Um, especially on on this particular tour where I, I'd come on and replaced um, <laughs> Billy, um, who's a popular, popular and world class player, and I, I, I'm neither of those things. So it was um, it was interesting, but I. I I, I just sort of go up and say hello um, and introduce myself and sort of don't let anyone awkward. But if anyone tries to not talk to me, I just won't let that happen because I'm like, don't try and give me the big man. So if there's that like, big man on campus, I'll just go straight up and say hello to them and like, you know, just say lots of things into their face and then sit down and make loud noises, maybe offend a few people and then just walk off. Yeah, I uh, walk in, go, go up to them, <laughs> offer a handshake. My name is Dan, <laughs> and then uh, we <laughs> uh, yeah, say hello to each other, and then the conversation almost stops there. We move on and talk to someone else, and then I'll find someone yeah. I do know, usually, and, and then, then he, and then he usually just comes, he usually comes back and just sits next to me. Yeah, yeah. what happened normally <laughs> happens is is that is that Coley will just nestle in the in the the shade of like of a doorway or something, and he'll pop out, not really know how to operate. How, and he, if anyone tried to give him the bro. He would say absolutely not. He would come in with a firm handshake, and go, yeah. all right, and be like, yeah, all right. And then he'd just nestle in back behind Mara and they'd sit in the corner, arms folded, just with sort of real kind of angry expressions on their faces. But I met Dan Cole, I, I, you know, I, I think he hates me. I was like, I think he hates everybody. I think it's just perfectly normal. Just on that, I'm really interested to know, Dan, how you've um, found things with the pandemic and that and having to fist pump people because <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Like James just said, you don't well, really like throw handshake and stuff like that. And yeah, fist yeah. pumping is definitely not not for you, is it? Uh, no, what I do is I just try and um, go as hard as possible. So when someone puts the fist bump out, you, there's always that one twat that punches really hard. That's me. So, um, yeah, I just do that. But I did find, like, you know, social distance in social isolation. That was fine. I just have lived my life for ever <laughs> you've never been happier you've never been happier i mean i don't on, have to leave the know... house all right then i, I don't, don't have, have to talk to, talk to humans that's fine my yeah. my favorite so, bit about coley mm-hmm. is you know you know you know you're really good friends with him after about 10 years he looks you in the eye because other <laughs> if you don't they don't normally get a lot of eye contact from coley it's sort of like a sideways look <laughs> Oh, hang on. We might be, we might be um, blessed with the present of Sir Best. Yes. Jesus Christ. You not you not get one of your minions or servants to sort it all out for you, no? Why does he sound like yeah, he's talking through a potato? Why do I get it? He's, he's off. Have you got any headphones, Rory? That would be my first question. <laughs> He's got a baked bean can with a string. Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I think he's drunk. Why do Zoom like everyone else? He's <laughs> got a fucking business meeting, you tit. Right. I'm all set now. Um, Sir Best. Welcome. 
Berchi. Berchi. Very good, thanks, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, good. Thank you ever so much for gracing us with your presence, albeit late um, and somewhat uh, distracting from the professional setup that was going on before you arrived. Um, <laughs> and also the non awkward chat that Coley was filling us with. Is that a question? <laughs> I fucking knew this. I knew this would happen. I knew you motherfuckers. You, you all turn around and you go, right, guys, let's all gang up on Hask, but you've actually flip reversed it and you're all going to fucking gang up on me. I knew it. I'm leaving. Sorry, who said they were going to gang up on me? It's not my show. <laughs> right, Rory, now you've joined us, you're going to get first go at answering this question. So when you're flying out to New Zealand, um, not only the reprobates on this call, but of the whole squad, who are the snorers on the flight? Who are the ones who are watching the movies? Who are the ones who are talking rugby from the word go? Uh, I, I was probably the snorer. Coley most certainly was snoring. Um, Haskell was talking rugby and absolute shite as well. Um <laughs> I think I don't think Hask. I think you were beside Courtney Laws, were you? I think he played that outrageous game for twenty hours straight. <laughs> yeah, he did. He just played non-stop video games the entire trip. Who was who was the first class five? You were, weren't you? Because there was five flights. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't remember oh, who yeah, else. Jared. Oh, no, yeah. I do remember. Jared was... Payne, Coley's mate. <laughs> it was me, Jared Payne. It was random out the hat. Was it Tyg? Did Tyg Furlong get it? Uh, I can't remember. It was Cruz one? Because then you can sizes on the flight. Benteo. Yeah, it might, who the fuck calls him Benteo? But if that if you mean by Benteo, then... Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> anyway, there was, Tom, there was this first class five that was all drawn out the hat and... Um, I was what very, touch. very lucky enough to to be part of that, and um, some boys kept coming up to see what it was like, and it wasn't actually that big a difference from what they were doing. But a lot of boys that are around Hass kept wanting to come up to the first class area because <laughs> he was annoying the fuck out of all of them, trying to prove to him that he wasn't that much of an arsehole. Did anyone want to go to economy to escape him? No, funny. Uh, I think there were some people tried to tried to jump out to escape him. <laughs> <laughs> My, yeah. Roy, someone spent the entire trip in the toilet just to get away from me. But I think it's the weird thing is the first class five slightly more popular than the geography six. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it was actually, it, it was actually, wasn't it geography seven? We worked out. I think we did work it out. There was... Well, it would have been seven if you'd let that player come on the field and not fucked him over. No, I think it was yeah. Geography 7 because you replaced Billy, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was not the Geography 7. Yes, is. How dare you? I was I was there at the start. Watch the Living With Lions DVD. You'll find, Tom, that nobody tried to escape me. Everyone embraced me. You were there, <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know that little uh, stuffed lion? I was you like were the doing a commercial that. gig every night. Try to charge us for being in that Italian restaurant. <laughs> yeah, I was. Spe <laughs> yeah, I did. Every time I had to entertain the lads, I tried to send them an invoice because I was like, listen, this isn't the tour. This is entertainment. Stopping people like Coley and Marlick, you know, scaring everyone and crying into their Italian food. And Rory Best, you know, getting all upset. I, I was literally the class clown for an entire, entire trip and then tried to charge him for it, rightly so. <laughs> the entire career the entire, it, since I was born here's a semi-serious question right when you go to New Zealand and they have won the last two World Cups at that point um, I think a lot of people back home were hopeful but not necessarily expecting much more so as a group of players who don't necessarily know each other that well and some of you know Warren Gatlin from before and some of you don't know him at all how do you all start convincing yourself and how do the coaches convince you that it's actually possible um I, I, I think you you know how good all the players are so you, you always think you have a chance you, and if they're a good team and it's a, not a particularly nice place to tour in New Zealand it's a little bit miserable but 
yeah, look, I think the first thing you do is you take a lot of confidence from how good the squad is, how good the players are. Um, and, yeah, look, I, I don't think when you go on a Lions tour that you need to be convinced that you're going to win. I think you go there expecting to win. How about you, Dan? Yeah, I agree with Rory. I think you look at the um, you know, the squad that was picked, um, the depth of it. And, you know, with, say, Lions tours that they're not as... Because um, you're in such a short space of time, it's basically getting the best players on the field in good a condition and you have a semblance of a game plan but um, you're relying upon the talent you've got and I think that's um, when you've got as quality players as you had you know you stand a chance Right James and Joe this is the the question I would like to ask you two so Warren Gatlin strikes me as, as potentially quite an intimidating character if you don't know him well so is there some massive amounts of ingratiation going on early doors how are you trying to impress him uh, this is that's a good question, Tom. Um, that you've aimed at, at me and James as well, because I would I was hazard a guess that we've got somewhat polar opposite experiences and opinions of a Mister Gatland. Is that right, James? I don't know what your opinion is of what Warren. So I, I don't know. We might we might share the same. We might not, or we might not be prepared to say it in public. So we'll go with whatever. What everyone's not going to cause any controversy. Let's go with that opinion, shall we? Well, you answer the question first, then, you tit. Um, I actually got new Warren at Wasp for, for, for years beforehand. Um, he was kind of responsible for helping me, along with Sean Edwards, have the career that I, I had. And I was very lucky early on in that, that point. So I, I have, obviously, a, a huge amount of kind of affection for him. And res- um, in terms of, you know, it's always ingratiating with people. I mean, I think I sort of operate the policy of trying to be good. But then if I know I'm going to make... The ninety nine percent the squad laugh, and maybe the coaches are the brunt of the jokes. I'm going to go for that. I mean, Rob Howley probably took most of my my focus on that door. Um, um, and so, no, I, I, I look. I think you always got to be polite. To, I think Warren is is quite intimidating. He's not. He's not. Um, he loves the chat, so he 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 was he was hovers around and wants to listen to the stuff and what's going on and loves a story. But he's not necessarily standing on tables handing out chat to people. So he can that kind of cold and slightly um you know sort of standing off at a distance so yeah you, it's difficult to get to know that the, the read on him but i i think you just kind of got to be yourself really i think if you try to be too much with any of these people they're going to see through it or you're going to get caught out so i just tried to go look i know you this is the situation and be myself i'd be like when it's supposed to be focused on rugby we're on rugby rest of the time don't care um i'm struggling with what ingratiation is first of all sucking up basically it means like trying to get yourself in with him like oh, ingratiate okay. like... um did i ingratiate did i ingratiate myself Ingrosh- Ingr- what is it ingratiate did i knob him ingratiate did, did i knob him off did he blow smoke up his ass team? um no i don't think i ever got really close enough to blow smoke up his ass he was quite a i found him quite an awkward character um which says a lot really cuz I tend to surround myself with awkward characters, don't I, Dan? Um, and I thought I thought it was all right. I thought I thought my experience of it was that it was quite obvious that the test team had already been picked, um, and it was going to be pretty hard to change a lot about that. But that's that's just my view of it. And then I think I struggled with him. <laughs> When I couldn't work out this scrum, uh, this scrum drill, I couldn't work out whether he was taking the piss out of us or whether he was being serious. Because, because both ways, if he was taking the piss out of us, then it's like, hang on a minute, you're taking the piss out of the midweek veg. You're really not working on trying to keep the squad together, are you? And if he wasn't taking the piss out of us and it was a legit drill he was trying to make us do, then you go, hang on a minute, you're meant to be one of the best coaches in the world. So it was like <laughs> it was like oh fuck what's going on here? Um, Bestie, do you remember? Do you remember that drill? I I remember it. I was standing by the side of the scrummage machine, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> up oh, and down. That was awful. And now, yeah. and now. I think I've had a few <laughs> low points in my career, and I do think that that is is up there with them. And then trying to come out of it, trying to keep a straight face and sort of go on. It's Tom. Sick. And then it's Tom, it's so hard to explain. And then you, then it's you. It's so hard to explain. But he basically <sighs> got us 
a pack of eight. Go on. I was just going to say, then you walk off and going, oh, for fuck's sake, is this really what we're meant to be doing with the Lions? I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> Do you remember when Andy Farrell heard you and told you off, or someone flew in and told you off for take the piss? And, we, and I, I remember standing there watching it, like, biting my tongue. Because I, I, I was like, I don't know anything about scrums, but, and now, and now, we're, look, and now, we're all, I we're just, all on this, shit back just on explain video. what was going on. We watched it back on video, and everyone on the sideline is pissing themselves as well, and there's three of us doing Correct. it, which is me, Cho, and Bestie, and we come to go, and now, and now, and now, and not, like, we've got to move our hips, but not move the scrum machine forward, and up. You could just, I'm giggling, and I could feel like Joe, the other side of Messi, shaking with laughter. <laughs> There's three of us doing this drill, trying to be serious, but, like, crying. Essentially, <laughs> the three of us were all um, fucking a scrum machine. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and gently, shouting. Gently. And now, and now. Almost with, like, a, you know, the class... Um, uh, What's it called? The spin class beat. Yeah. And now, and now, and now. And we'd step it up a gear. And now, and now, and now, and now. And I'm like, fuck me, dead lads. What's going on? This is meant to be the pinnacle of our careers here. And uh, I can't work this out. But everyone was having a giggle. And I thought, as I walked off, and I, I was like, fucking hell, what has just happened? I think Big Faz has overheard me. And he's like, phew. Yeah, what the fuck you? What are you saying about that drill? And I went, it's fucking dog shit. He's like, yeah, well, fucking go and tell him then. It's if it's dog shit, we'll go and fucking tell him. And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. I'll do that. Yeah, no worries, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was awful. Yeah. Did you tell him? Did you just unmute yourself to laugh? <laughs> I, I don't seem to be controlling the mute, <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> I thought you were controlling it. <laughs> oh, it's Louise is doing it. I was going every now and again, it comes up as I'm muted. I'm going, well, for fuck's sake, like I actually would have something to contribute here. No, but I'm not I allowed think... to. <laughs> so you bring me on, you put me on Chrome, which we don't use in Ireland, and then you mute me. <laughs> Rory, give us your side of that story then. Uh, it's the man in the middle of, of Dan and it Joe. Was just... Honestly, it was one of those moments there that because we were all there, it was ridiculous. You try to explain it to somebody and they kind of go, oh, right, so you're in a scrum machine and you're trying to get your timing right. And you're going, no, 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 that that's not what it was. I know it might sound like that, but you know these are seasoned internationals you're talking about. And he did not want the machine to go forward. And it was honestly, it was dropping your hips up and down to and now, and now, and like the boys said, the worst thing about it was we were in the middle of it, so we had to do it. And everyone else around is just going, this is a fucking stitch up. Where is the hidden camera? Laughing. And you're kind of having to take it reasonably serious because you're playing a game either the next day or the day after. But I was just like, yeah, it was. I've done some shit drills in my time, but that was well up there. It was. It was. It was good fun. I, to be fair, like James has said, he's. I guess. Um, Gats has been on. God knows how many Lions tours now. Uh, he's won God knows how many trophies, and he's a big supporter of you, James. And and he also before um, the Lions as well. I remember my first contact was him dropping me a message. Um, of support after Gypsy Gate, um, that it all blown up, and uh, he said, you know, don't worry about it, keep your head down, yada yada, out of the blue. So, um, you know, he's he's a, he's I'm sure he's a good bloke, um, and he's got a good art. It's just a couple of my experiences were probably <laughs> um, interesting to I say. I think it's least. ID, the lions, I mean, the no, the no, no eye contact, handshakes. Yeah. Go on, Rory, you're on a slight delay, okay. so we're going to give you a bit more the, time. So the Lions is, is ideally set up for them, really, because the game plan is it's quite easy to pick up. It's very direct. It's very straightforward. You know what he expects from you, and when you don't have a lot of preparation time or you're playing twice a week, you know it, it is sort of set up for that. Um, but there are times whenever, I think ultimately as well, when you're not 
getting picked in the test team, you sort of you have to blame everyone else because it couldn't possibly be your own fault. So it couldn't. Um, and you just like you're surrounded by great players, so like not everyone can play. But um, yeah, it was funny. My last ever game was Barbarians against Wales, and he was the coach, and he was giving a bit of a speech to say, look. You know, it was brilliant. You know, Scott Brits, last game, blah, 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 you know, played. And then he got to me and he went, Rory, honestly, I saw you play in 2012 13 season um, against Northampton in the European Cup. And he goes, honestly, I think it's the best performance a hooker has ever given uh, in a European Cup game. And I was thinking, going, I'm pretty sure that's the year you didn't pick me for the Lions originally. So it couldn't have been that fucking good. <laughs> Okay, so there's always one or two players, even though I'm sure you get a feeling early on what the test team might be. There's always one or two players for people watching back home who make the first test, and it's a little bit of a surprise. And maybe in 2017, that was Peter Omani coming in as skipper. Maybe for some people, it might have been Ben Teo. Do you guys get a feel, James, first of all, do you guys get a feel for which way the selection's going to go, or are you blindsided sometimes as well? I mean, look, when you're sort of the midweek veg or the bin juice, I don't, you know, you don't, you don't really um, pay too much attention to it because I think it's pretty clear in terms of... Um, the, can, can we meet Rory? Because the airplane sound is <laughs> quite extensive. Oh, there we are. Thank oh, fuck fucking hell. No, We've got yeah. to get to the bottom of that. <laughs> so the, no, the, the honest answer is I think when you're sort of in the bin juice, the midweek veg, it's very difficult, you know, you're sort of aware that you're not going to be involved um you know you, you the sort of the way these teams work is that you know like their favorite thing is you go out to training and they hand out a load of bibs and they're like don't read into it and you're like that is the test team right there and they're like no it's not anything could happen it's like no that's 100 percent the test team well you know anyone could, anyone could play no no you've given all the bibs to them those bibs they don't read into the bibs. The bibs mean everything. Like you know straight away. So you get a good inkling for it. I think. Um, I mean, the Peter O'Mahony thing was great because he obviously came in as captain, and then played the game, and then and then was dropped, and obviously had gone from that elite level of like Lions captain, the greatest moment in his career, while all the rest of us, the rabble, the kit carriers, the you know the motley crew of idiots that aren't involved, we we were the ones to pick up the pieces because he just got unceremoniously binned out, and we were like Peter. Come on, mate. Didn't he get come for dinner with us? And, and, it, and it was like <laughs> he did get dropped to the breakfast table. And it was like you know the because um, the best way they do it is they tap you on the shoulder and go, "Can I have a word?" And what I used to do because Graham Roundtree used to always do it to me. I I wouldn't come to meals, so he had to find me. They're like, "Have you seen Hass?" I was like hiding under beds, hiding in the cupboards. Because my idea was that if he couldn't find you, then he couldn't drop you. But they dropped Peter Romani at the breakfast table. But obviously he missed out the training session, was with the midweek veg. We went out to dinner that night. And honestly, it was like the evolution of man, but the reverse. Like this tall, upright man. By the end of the night, he had his baseball cap on, was like tense fists, talking in the most aggressive Irish accent, drunk as hell, cursing everybody. Um, and that's basically how he spent the rest of the tour with us. Um, and so, yeah, it was uh, those moments are quite interesting. But in terms of like real surprises... Not really. I didn't, you know, I mean, if they'd picked me or that would have been a surprise. But otherwise, I think it was pretty much nailed on from the start. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I uh, ask is right. I also think, I know we said it a lot, but that 17 tour, there's so many good players. There weren't really much of a surprise. I think what, what probably surprised a little bit was there was a few of the outside backs that played in the Chiefs game that ended up almost playing on that Tuesday and then coming in because they'd, they played so well. Um, obviously, it was nothing to do with the platform being set up front, but um, they they came in and, and ended up starting. <laughs> um, so they did. Um, yeah, so I think that, that they generally, if you're in that Tuesday team before the test, you're going no chance. But uh, for a couple of those boys to come in and start, I think it was Elliot Daly and Liam Williams would be were two of them. I think the writing was on the wall as well when the, uh, the geographical six... Um, came out, didn't they? And they were put on the bench for that Chiefs game. And it was like, oh, you've ring-fenced the test team. Which, you know, kind of made sense, but I think put a couple of noses out of joint. Has this, this isn't a that fucking DJ no. set. You, you, that that sorry, me. sorry. I, I, <laughs> just because, someone, that else, wasn't me, just no, because someone else is speaking <laughs> doesn't mean you need to interrupt and make it all about you. Let Dan fucking speak. We're here to nurture him. 
<laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was the um, that you kind of knew that that team there was the Chiefs, and it was um, with the extra boys that came out that that was, you know, not going to be playing the test. So how do you how do you boys feel now looking back on um, 2017 and the geography six? Do you still feel the same as you did on tour? about it being a bit like because there was unrest not unrest but yeah. the murmurs throughout the majority of the squad were like what the fuck guys and it wasn't yeah. it wasn't so much toward for me it was to, rory can you fucking mute yourself <laughs> wonderful <laughs> it for me it i look back on it and i go i regret the way i behaved towards the the six players for the majority of the time, for some reason, I just went full resentment towards them as if it was their fault they'd been called up. That that when they got the call up, they should have turned around and said, no, don't fancy it, actually. You know, do you know what I mean? That's yeah. how I oh, yeah, felt at the totally, time. And looking back I, on it, totally. I'm like, that's fucking bullshit from me. And especially <laughs> especially the point at which, what game was it? The, the Hurricanes game. Hurricanes, when yeah. Wig tried subbing us off. And, <laughs> and you refused to so let it happen. Fuck off. You told you told I'm the referee sorry. you and you and your strange relationship with Ram Poit. You basically uh, said the substitution's not happening, and he's like, "All right, then play on." And that was the final like <laughs> ten minutes of the game. Was it, it you basically denying the chance of the subs to come on? But yeah, which was ironic considering I think the only bloke of the Giraffic Six that got on was Alan Dell when you got yellow carded against the Chiefs the week before. <laughs> For a shot that was yeah late, um, but yeah no I I agree with you I think like at the time you know it was a bit of a, a shock but you know you look back and if you're one of those boys and someone says to you you can come out of the Lions tour and you know you're gonna say yes aren't you no one's gonna say no I think the thing that sort of annoyed people was the fact that it was like there was a lot of boys that probably missed out on selection the first time round like your launch bridge of this world that could have come out and added and you kind of thought that there would be you know that's the Lions, and whereas they kind of went for blokes that were on tour at the time, and you know I think it probably at the time you felt a bit it didn't cheapen it, but you felt it was you know it should have been those blokes who were next in line who have just missed out, who've been desperate to play for the Lions and may never do that, but then you know you look back and you're like it happened, and yeah you would probably um, regret not you know you were a bit harsher than the rest of us, Joe, but. Um, you know, it's not those blokes' faults, and we probably they probably bore the brunt of it in the squad when they shouldn't have. Because, you know, if you were in their situation, of course you're going to come. You'd snap your hand off to get the chance to come. Who were the Who were the lads who you didn't know who each of you um, got on really well with? James, you first. Anyone in particular that you hadn't fancied before, hadn't got to know, and Rory you ended best. up best mates with? I, th I thought he was a very odd little man, little like, egg-shaped person, little white scrum cap running around, incoherently speaking with his tool mate that I couldn't. Both, well, I, I, honestly, they spoke to me. I, I didn't know that they were just speaking English with an Irish accent. I thought they were speaking like Irish. I thought it was a different language. I thought the whole time, what are they saying? I mean, Rory was better than Ian Henderson, but I couldn't understand what they did. And they just walked around like Shrek and Donkey the whole time. But he's someone that I... I wanted to be like everybody had always talked about him being such a uh, a good guy, and he was someone that I I bonded with. And basically, you know, I mean, I, I would say we're now we're now friends for life. Like I love Rory. I think uh, he made my tour like like these other two guys did. Um, I think someone like Dan Bigger and Johnny Sexton. Um, I thought I thought I'm never going to be friends with them. You know, Johnny Sexton was a guy that the last time I played against Leinster, he he ran over and called me a cheating something. And I, I can't say what I said to him because I, I don't know I mean, how bad the swearing is on this, but I basically said something to him and he, he was like open mouth because he'd never been insulted to that degree. So much so that the referee, Nigel Owens, had to call me to one side and was like, you can't, there's women and children watching that. Mothers and children. And I said, well, my mum taught me that. And he was like, I don't, <laughs> I don't think she did. Um, and I thought I was never going to get on with him. And someone like Dan Bigger as well, he, uh, you know, Real competitor. I thought we we're gonna have nothing in common, but both of them I got on with. Are now friends. Speak to them a lot. Um, and I, I mean, I basically, you know, just go about the geography six thing. I, I, I saw it slightly different. Like I understand actually Dan's Cole's, um, 
Dan, Dan's point is very correct in terms of those other players that could have flown out and, and it would have made more sense. I didn't really ever have an a, opinion about those guys. I was sort of just so pleased to be there and excited to be part of it. I was a bit like wide-eyed and just very excited to kind of meet people and all these guys that I played against so many times over the years and basically had these big battles with and never got to know, like Sean O'Brien. I wanted Sean O'Brien to like be the Irish equivalent of me. Like I, I asked in my mind, I was like, oh, he's going to be that that kind of character. And then, you know, I, I wanted to, to meet all these guys that you sort of kick fuck out with for, for so long. So with someone like the Geography Six and stuff, I, I just treated them as... Like got to know them. They, they, I remember they had to stand up and do some stupid stuff. Do you remember, like, do a presentation? I, I don't think Corey Hill was that keen on me because when we went to do one training session and um, he was injured and he just arrived and I, and I was like, he didn't take part in the scrummaging session. I was like, what the fuck's happened to you? Did you fall off the bus? <laughs> and, and everyone was like, oh, it's a bit, a bit harsh. Because I was like, I can't, are you haven't... How have you not? What have you been injured? How have you done that? Like, and so that, I don't think you. But then we subsequently got on well. I like how I, you just spent I love the last thought. five minutes saying how nice you were to them, and then your first interaction going yeah. to a training session was that you were too <laughs> harsh about him being injured and not being able to train. Yeah, but I'm just, I'm just saying because how can you, how can you turn up to train and get injured when you haven't done anything? Like, how have you got injured getting between the hotel and the bus? Like and, and the training field, like that's that's got to be a turn up for the books. If you're the geography six, you're training at all, all costs. He was like, no, but I can't, I can't train. Best, like, bestie, what about you, mate? Who, who were you worried about or had a preconceived idea on the on the tour that either confirmed your idea of them or changed their perce- your perception of them? I think that tour in, in 2017 especially was one where I think everyone, like there weren't very many people on it that you wouldn't say you came away going, don't really like him or I'm not going to spend a lot of time with him. I think like it was a really good, good bunch. I must say, and I've said it before, like I was a bit, I was a bit unsure when Hasker called up late, I must say, but again, completely changed my mind on him. I kind of knew him as a bit of a gobshite, but just wasn't a hundred percent sure. But honestly, by the end of it, it was just, and probably Joe, you a bit the same. Um, you just you do have when you play against these guys or you guys or whoever it is, you kind of have this bit of an idea of what you're going to be like, and it turns out that it's wrong. And I think that was that was the case right throughout it. And I really like I really enjoyed that tour, and I think largely because of when I compared the two tours, the 13 tour, I, I played a lot worse than I did in 17. But in terms of test appearances, it was the same. It was midweek. Captain Midweek team, well done. What a great honour. Yeah, it is fantastic. Uh, I would definitely give that up to play in the in the test. But in terms of my enjoyment, 17 was, was so much better because of the people you were surrounded with. How about you, Dan? Who did you enjoy hanging out with um, apart from Joe? Ooh, let, me, let me get my list out. Um, no, I remember, I say, uh, I was mentioning, but I remember... Um, Dan Bigger. I mean, I didn't know the bloke beforehand, but you kind of, when you watch him play, um, you know, you, you can make your own assumptions. But then I remember we were on the, we all had a bonding session on the piss in Dublin and the week before we flew out. And I just remember getting on the bus, I think, and he said to me, um, I always thought you're a prick. I was like, what? Where'd you get that impression from? And I was like, well, actually, <laughs> mate, you're the prick. And then from that point on, he was brilliant. Like, a lovely guy, got on really well. Um, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, once the tour finished, I haven't spoke to him since, but um, that was good. So yeah, he was right. <laughs> who, have, who have you? Who have you spoken to since that tour? Uh, you, Hask, and Bestie. Excellent. Tonight. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I can't remember. There was a few others, but no, I think like because you mainly know blokes from and around, so there's only a couple men in the backs that you don't know. Um, and then, yeah, once you're done, you're done, aren't you? I'd, um, I'd echo... Right, Jojo, I'd... <laughs> what, what was the single... Can we talk about Ian Henderson as well for a minute? I know he's bestie's sidekick. But there was a moment, do you remember, Joe, in... Uh, where were we? Um, Hamilton, maybe. And we were coming back from an escape room, and I think it was three of... It was like you, me, Tips, and it might have been Hask. And we're walking down the street, and Hendo's coming the other way with his fiance at the time, now, now married. And he, we all looked at him, like, waiting to be introduced. And he just looked at us and just walked straight past. <laughs> just totally <laughs> fucked us all off. And it was just like, cheers. 
Good to see he you. also Maybe picked up speed, way. I think. He did definitely pick up speed. <laughs> Did we get in the lift with him right. as well, just randomly later on? He just still just didn't talk at all. There's like four of us in the lift, yeah. and he's just like, yeah, one of the strangest blokes word. I've <laughs> ever come across. I only spoke to him. I only spoke to him when we did that. We did that 24 hours of drinking at the table. <laughs> like the rest of the time, I you know I genuinely couldn't understand what he was saying, and I couldn't work out what he hated me because he had a bit of the old Tom Palmer about him, oh. didn't he? The serial killer. <laughs> You know, that kind of like quiet uh, sort of... Just to clarify, you know, like, Tom made, Palmer, you know, the ex-Wasps lock, an uh, England lock, he is not yeah. a serial killer. That is um, needed to no, say No, but publicly. he did he, <laughs> he did leave Wasps because he ran out of space under his patio and go to Stade Francais. <laughs> so, uh, he's actually not a serial killer. But if he does turn out to be one, you heard it here first. What was... Rory, I feel like you should you should leap to Ian Henderson's defence here. No, Hendy's a very special person, very special. I think it was actually before one of the test matches. Um, was it the Hask? I think you were there with us. We we're getting some lunch, and we're kind of sort of sitting down. Hask has gone into full on panic mode because he hasn't eaten in three hours. And you're there going, well, you're standing in a restaurant, just going fucking order something. Like we're getting a couple of pints, you get whatever you want. So we had a couple of pints over lunch. And uh, next thing, Hendy goes, oh, fuck, I better go, get back to the hotel. Uh, I think I'm warming up as 24th man tonight. <laughs> I was like going, Hendy, just a couple of pints. He's like going, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll never get on, it's fine. Uh, I remember, wasn't it Light Out D as well? He was called Light Out D and it was like a mirror defence. And like, he was like, mirror. And it was like, everyone would, I think you, Marlo, were literally like, what the fuck are you saying? He's like, mirror. It's like... What's that, mate? <laughs> Brr. It's like, and he just—he didn't talking tell the joke. About the three wise men. Are you t- <laughs> yeah, about, but that's what he was saying. Mirror defense, wasn't he? But like, literally, Hendo didn't me. get the joke. Everyone else is like, <laughs> "What the fuck are you saying?" And he's like, "Mirror." Like, right? And he just couldn't comprehend what we were laughing at. He was fucking brilliant. Mirror. I would <laughs> say so you'll come back. I would echo Rory's words earlier, Tom. That. Um, I, I haven't had any pre-experience of, of a Lions tour, but the the tightness, the unity of the 40, 41-man squad was like massive, massively apparent to me. And there wasn't, there, there's always been that talk of separation between the test team and the veg and all that, like, which there is naturally, of course there is. You end up training at different times or and different focuses at... You know, the, the test team can't go on the piss as much. And they have two things. But I thought the tightness of the whole group was was genuine. It wasn't just fluffing each other or just paying lip service to it all. And I don't know if you remember this, Bestie, but I remember you having a pint, obviously. Um, and you talking about 2013 and saying that you you were putting such a big focus on this tour and approaching it differently to how you did in 2013 because you I think you remember saying that you were quite bitter or the way you ended that tour wasn't how you wanted to and you look back on it and you wish you'd enjoyed it more or contributed more in terms of the boys that weren't involved and to try and keep them on side a bit more and um, that really stuck with me for, for 2017 and the amount of effort that you you put in to make sure that the guys that weren't involved, like ourselves, still managed to have an unbelievable time. He's going to turn around and says, I don't remember that because I was half cut the entire time. Uh, well, uh, you know what? I do remember. I certainly remember the feeling from 13 and look, it was just, you, you kind of, it is what you make of it. And that tour in particular felt really, disjointed and I know Coley speak can speak about it as well but it just sort of felt it also I don't think the caliber of players we had was, was probably quite the same in some positions and you kind of I remember leaving that as I was probably 31 I think on that tour and kind of going well there's no way I'll ever go on another Lions tour in four years time no chance and to get the chance again and then to for you to miss that lift against the Auckland Blues and for obviously for me to take the blame for it um, I kind of knew then that I wasn't going. I wasn't probably, certainly not at the start, I wasn't going to play in the test. Um, I'm just going, having a moment or two where it felt like 13, where I nearly went, you know what, I just want to go home and give up. And 
after a day or two, I just went, look, I have a chance here to actually play in a Lions jersey and it be more of a reflection of what I feel I can, I can do. And if I don't play in the test, I don't play in the test. But uh, my God, I'm going to make sure that at least I'm going to enjoy playing the midweek team and I'm going to try to play as well as I can personally. But also as a team, it's kind of almost where you go, right, well, look, we're unbelievably talented players in this team. Don't be sort of... Let, take the shackles off nearly and go and play and enjoy playing and throw the ball about a little bit when you get your chances of forward to scrum or maul or whatever area it is just go and fucking do it and do it the best you can and don't feel sorry for yourself because life can be full of regrets and, and I was really fortunate to get another go at it Question for you James what was the single best night out was it the one in Queenstown is it Stories about a cheeky night out in um, Queenstown between I, the second you know and third tests. I, I would say that the night that we won the first, the, uh, first game on tour, you know, uh, I think I didn't appreciate it, but you know, we lost we lost the first couple of games uh, on that tour, and it was like, you know, we really had a lot of pressure the midweek team to get things back on back on tour, and that's kind of responsibility. Like what Rory said, and, and he, you know, as a captain, he sp- always spoke very well. Um, about that stuff on the field and in team meetings and stuff. And and I think we all felt part of something. And even if, you know, I, I was never really concerned about the test stuff. It, it would have been the dream. And I came away going, you know, do I, can I call myself a lion? Cause I didn't play in the test side. Now I didn't do that. And I don't go, I don't regard myself as that cause I didn't get a test spot, but actually what we did out there to win that game and get the first win on the road was so important and I you know I never forget that we you know we came in and Warren Gatlin came in the changing room and was talking to everybody and was like you know getting everyone around this guy's unbelievable performance you know we haven't made our minds up you know that's a great and I just interrupted him and so you're saying there's a chance and everyone was like ah! I, and then we basically got on the bus and sat on the back of the bus and you know got the first win on tour taking the pressure off the rest of the team and we were able to go and have a night out. And I think that was just when Rory had been knighted Sir Best of Ireland or whatever. And we just, he was he was like our our figurehead, our like emotional leader. And I just remember me, Coley, Rory, and all these boys in the back of the bus just drinking beers, laughing, so excited that we'd won in a Lions jersey, that we'd won, you know, our first kind of proper game, going back to the hotel, going out, seeing the fans. Um, and, you know, all of them wanting to come up and talk to people. And we're like, nah. Unless you, if you want to talk to us, you have to buy us a beer. And they're like, no, seriously. I was like, no, um, let me just interrupt you. I was Dan Cole's agent. If you want to speak to Coley, go and buy us a beer. And we ended up at a table about about 400 kroners. And someone would ask a question and then we'd go, no, 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 no. It's one drink per question. You don't get to go off to a whole thing and pin someone in the corner. <laughs> Mate, it was just stuff like that. It was just so funny. And every time, every time we went anywhere, Bestie, we just made everyone call him Sir Best. We would salute him into everything we did. We played this, we played this non-stop drinking game the whole time that evolved all these actions. <laughs> I still remember it now. It was Hask, Hask. I can't remember what Rory was. But it was just, we did it everywhere we went, took over these places. And then we trained the house down. And went again and got a couple of wins and had these kind of emotional journey where we, you know, we should have beaten the Highlanders, but we lost. Then the Hurricanes, you know, we we ended up blowing a 30 point lead or something where we, we, you know, we were on fire. Couldn't have, couldn't have done better. And all these moments could, could, you know, came together. But the first night was definitely the best. Go Rory, you've you've, you've given us the the big helicopter noise. I think it's only fitting you have the... The next part of that story. Yeah, no, there, there were some, there were some really good nights out actually. Yeah, I really enjoyed the the night in the Italian restaurant, mainly because it was the breaking of George Cruz, which was obviously incredible. Um, it, boy, no, it was just, it was brilliant. Um, <laughs> do you know what? It was just, it was just really good fun. I'm pretty sure at the back of that bus you're talking about as well, Hask. We were also doing the scrum move. I'm pretty sure there's a there's a picture in my head of Coley almost hanging off sort of one of the roof racks going, and now, and now, and now. <laughs> yeah, so that was really, really good fun. Really good fun. <laughs> um, Dan, what did well, the breaking of George Cruz week. involve? Um, so he played the first test, didn't he? So he went from the highest honour in <laughs> World Rugby of, you know, uh, played the first test. He then had not his finest hour in a Lions jersey, well, in any jersey. Um <laughs> And then I can't remember if he, 
basically, was it the video review came next a couple of days later, didn't it? And, ba- and I think Rob Howley basically went, it's in Marla's book, if anyone wants to re- buy that and read it. But basically, <laughs> Good yeah, plug, Rob Dan. Howley picked yeah, up like, yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the, yeah. Thanks for the signed copy, Joe. Appreciate that. Loved it. Um, but like the, uh, I think it was like three or four clips, basically, cruise, cruise, cruise. He then like said, he was trying, you could see the, the were in and cruise head trying to make an excuse because he was going to, um, he fucked up a pick and go, didn't he, or something like that. And he's like, Rob Halley had spoke for about five minutes about promoting a 12. And then he went back to Cruz and Cruz like, Rob, why don't we promote an inside centre to carry? He's like, oh my God, have you been listening? And anyway, it went on, went on, went on. He then went to the defensive clips and there were Faz was just going, it was like George Cruz, George Cruz. And Faz cut his short, but as he cut it short, the video analyst, they clicked onto the next clip and that was also at the bottom, <laughs> didn't add <that>, like <laughs> Cruz. <laughs> so he, I there. he then basically... Got uh, dropped, didn't he? I think he got put in the on the bench for the midweek, and then like he was, <laughs> yeah. Basically, his all week was getting shit because he was like doing a line out walkthrough, and he's like, "Cruz, why are you here? Why are you here, Cruz?" He's like, "Cause I've been dropped." Like anyway, so then I think he got halfway through that game, didn't he? He came on for Courtney, so that was like, oh, he's not playing in the test. Courtney is well done, uh, Cruz. So they gave him shit as he came on the field. Anyway, that night we then well the next night we went out for an Italian restaurant, wasn't it? In the, Best deal organised this VIP uh, Italian restaurant, which was basically a shed in someone's fucking garden um, on the piss. Like, I don't know what the barbell was, but it was... Omani had been dropped well because it came to the final three, didn't it, in the credit card roulette. And it was Omani, Marla and Cruz. Then it went down to just Marla and Cruz. And it was like, well, and Cruz didn't want to play originally because he shouldn't have been there. Um, which always is karma. He basically then ended up losing, didn't he? Had to pay, was it three grand something like that on the, the bill? <laughs> yeah, well, I um, did say to him, I said, look, Cruz, it's quite a hefty bill. Let's just go 50-50. <gasps> and because he'd gone that far down the down the road, um, he went, no, no, um, no, I want to go all the way then. I want to go all the way. We're like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. And like you said, Dan, karma really fucked him there. And yeah. uh, he ended up losing and paying the whole fucking thing. And it was just... Yeah. Wonderful. Then he got us. It was wonderful. Also, yeah, we had a great night out. The next day, he's got a like him and Steve Borthwick played together, didn't they? And like, I remember us going down to you, Marla, text Steve, like, ask Cruz how his night was. And uh, Steve didn't tell anything else. And just Cruz <laughs> explaining his night to Steve. Just, I think that made Steve's tour just literally crying with laughter about Cruz. Uh, and then, was it the next day? We had a non 23. The, the final part, which people don't remember is he had to pay for this bill, but then two days later, I think, on the morning of the test, we all had fitness in the local gym, and we were in groups of three, and we had to rotate around. There's like a station on the Versiclime or the Watt bike. I think there was weights. And Cruz was first up on the rowing machine, and as he literally took the first stroke, the thing snapped in half. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, no. <laughs> and that was just crew. Like, it was just, it couldn't have got any work. That was, yeah. Um, but he had a good time. Um, but yeah, that's what we remember is basically <laughs> the downfall of Cruz. Yeah, so we'll, we'll pay him back. We'll still pay back George. It's fine. The twenty-four hour drinking. Can I just clarify? Were there any other? Yeah, rules when Rory Best said finish drink your drink, you have to finish hours. your drink. He said, "I said, can we play a drinking game?" I was like, "What's the game?" And he just went, "Drink it." And, you, and you, I'm like, "What's that game?" And you just you have to finish it. And it, whenever he felt like it, we just, he just we had to drink it. That wasn't scary. And then putting toothpicks into our heads. I remember sitting next to him and he goes, "Has, has, has." <laughs> And sticks a toothpick right in his head. And I was like, what, what's the game, Rory? He goes, no, there isn't a game. You just stick toothpicks in your head. And we're all sitting there. I look like Hellraiser with just toothpicks sticking out of my head with blood like dripping down my head. And then you go, finish it. And we just knack another. It was awful. There was zero skills to this. It was just called Next. It's quite simple. Um, the big thing when you're dealing with these boys is not to overcomplicate things. But on the toothpick thing, now that is, Coley has to take some responsibility for that because that was... At the very end of 2013, I think it was yeah. Tom Young's introduced me to it, and I thought this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he was like putting it in his in his earlobes and his eyelids and everywhere. It was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Boys, boys, boys. We honestly, my cheeks are hurting um, <laughs> from reminiscing about that tour and the stuff that that took place and I've got nothing but fond memories having looking back on it now. And there's some, there's some things I would have done differently, like we, we've all mentioned. Um, but the memories I've got f- from that tour, are unbelievable. And I could sit here all night chatting shit with you boys about various different stories that we haven't touched on already. Um, 
but I can't because I've got four kids, one of which is screaming the house down. Um, and I also can't stand listening to the jet that's been flying over Rory's house circling for the last hour and a half. Um, so it's fucking giving me a migraine <laughs> as well as the builder's light that I've put in my caravel. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for coming on, boys. I was quite nervous, but also looking forward to doing this one. But thank you for giving up your time, especially you, um, James, because you seem to um, be doing everything. So it's so kind of you to give me five minutes. Listen, any opportunity to spend any time with you lads, I'd do it all again. I have the best memories of 2017. I wish that we could go to do an escape room then have a night out with a drinking game and just descend into chaos and then wake up and do it all again at breakfast. 